Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum and good morning. So, continue with our lectures. Uh, I've skipped certain parts of the previous chapter, which is chapter 5. So, I'm going to jump straight into chapter 6 because we need to finish at this until chapter 10. Okay. So our target is actually to, to include chapter 10 uh, and that should be enough for the course. Okay. So today I'm just going to do this on the board again. I don't, I'm pretty slow in typing up the notes. So uh, so in chapter 6, sorry, I have to look at it. Uh, chapter 6, uh, we are going to uh, discuss about identical particles. Oops, I don't want that. Yes. Uh, identical particles. And how this essentially affects the uh, statistical mechanics, we will look at it from the point of view of partition function later on. Okay. So, first and foremost, uh, let me just uh, sort of recall what we have done previously. So, the assumption uh, in the previous cases is that we can distinguish particles, okay. meaning uh, one can actually know uh, which is particle 1, which is particle 2, and so on. So this part, they might be the same, uh, uh, of even the same type, okay? But we are, uh, from experiments, okay, uh, okay, maybe I should mention about quantum theory first. Quantum theory, uh, uh, the idea of indistinguishability becomes important. Okay. So we will, we will uh, uh, show this in a minute. This is important rule. Okay. So, what is known experimentally? For example, okay, here's an uh, example for, say, electrons okay electrons uh, uh, modulo of uh, their locations spatial, spatial location uh, and momenta if we take away uh, their location and momenta all electrons look the same. Okay. And the only thing that distinguish between them, the distinguish, uh, distinguishability is coming from the quantum state. Okay. Comes from quantum state. Okay. For which, uh, you know, if one thinks of the spatial location can also be thought of as a part of uh, the description of quantum states or even the momentum. Okay, so this, uh, this mostly refers to your quantum number. Okay. And it could include the spatial locations and also the momentum. Okay, so how, what else do we know about uh, identical particles? The problem with, even with, with this distinguishability uh, in spatial location, okay, we have the problem of uncertainty, uncertainty principle, okay. I believe you have done this. Uh, essentially, uh, Precisely, uh, could not precisely determine uh, the 
location both location and moment of particle now how this would actually affect uh, what we uh, what we can actually calculate for example is the case of this kind of scattering process so given that uh, one cannot resolve uh, beyond uh, what is uh, allowed by let me write this as issue P is not by issue P which is really what uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle okay. so uh, given that so you have scattering processes like this that might happen so here's a scattering process one particle coming in, another particle coming in, scatter this way, that way, and then essentially there will be some, some uh, uh, what you call interaction here. So the interaction here is probably uh, within, uh, one can actually see it because of the uh, the resolution uh, limitation by the uncertainty principle. So one could not distinguish between this scattering with this scattering. This is that way. Again, one cannot see the thing in the middle, in the box, okay, because of the, the limitation given by uncertainty principle. So this uh, can be indistinguishable. So it's not just simply the quantum numbers, but you also have this problem with respect to scattering processes. Okay, so how does one actually uh, include all this uh, idea of indistinguishability in, in uh, quantum theory is to look in terms of symmetry. So in quantum theory, uh, so uh, particles are classified by symmetries. And in particular, over here, there's a symmetry under permutation. Okay. For example, over here in the scattering process, uh, consider this as particle 1 and this is particle 2. So there is, over here is, there is no difference between particle 1 and particle 2. Okay. So particle 1, particle 2. So one could actually swap this around. Okay. Uh, and essentially you still have that indistinguishability. Okay. So here the symmetry and the permutation is called, this is called exchange symmetry. Okay, so how can, so these are just words, so one needs to be able to quantify this in a way, so uh, how does one actually do that? Sorry. Uh, so uh, what one can do is to define a two-particle wave function. So I'm 
simple and we can generalize this later on two particle wave function given by psi x1 psi x sorry uh, I do not want that just hang on a minute so I would just have the wave function uh, and then there are parameters that sort of gives you the, the two locations of the, the two particles okay so uh, so if you exchange labels in this case the, the labels are given in terms of the location so exchange labels then you have another wave function which is again a two particle wave function given by this so how do we understand this so if if this is actually distinguishable so this is particle one uh, in location x1 particle 2 in location x2 and in this one this is that in this one it's particle 1 in location x2 and this is particle sorry, particle 2 in location x1 now if there is this what we call the permutation symmetry or the exchange symmetry there must be a relationship between the two so where does the relationship comes in is in terms of the probability so uh, let me write down the probability first the probability of finding particle in the volume of say uh, d3s1 d3s2 okay so you can consider uh, the two uh, local so-called uh, spatial locations then uh, this should be given by this modulus of the wave function thing. Or I should say the two particles. Okay. Two particles in the volume of D3S1, D3S2. So this is square. Okay. So, the exchange symmetry uh, requires that the probability is the same even if you uh, exchange the locations. So, in other words, what we need in this particular case, so exchange symmetry requires this probability. must be equal to this the, uh, if you exchange the location it must be the same okay so how can you actually have uh, so remember that your psi is a is essentially a, a, a complex valued quantity it's a complex function so given this uh, so given your psi is a complex function Then this two wave function with the, the label swap can only be related by a phase vector. Okay. Psi x1, x2 has to be equal to some uh, scalar uh, which belongs to complex numbers but of, uh, of, of modulus 1. So when you uh, take the modulus squared, 
this is just give you this just gives you one okay okay now the question is what well, what is this alpha supposed to be well uh, okay uh, what one can actually think is the following uh, one can think if you make the swap the, the, the swap of the labels twice so here I'm changing from x1 to x2 to give you x2 x1 and I exchange again uh, x2 and x1 then okay, uh, interchange twice should give me uh, the factor twice so in other words I will get e to i alpha psi x2 sorry psi x1 x2 because I'm interchanging uh, this x2 and x1 again and this should be the same as the the, the original wave function with x1 x2 there so what does that gives you that would actually gives you these two possibilities so th this implies e to i alpha equals to 1 so there are two different alpha values that uh, you know that uh, exponential i alpha is just cos alpha plus sine i sine alpha so this can only be alpha equals 0 or pi okay so now oops. so there are two poss poss possibilities given this two values of alpha so two possibilities so the first possibility is if you interchange your x1 and x2 you get a plus sign that means it's, uh, it doesn't change sign so this is uh, what we call a symmetric wave function under the exchange okay. and then the other one which is the case of alpha equals to pi uh, so ei pi for example is cos pi plus i sine pi and that is negative one okay so this the second possibility would be to have this negative sign so this is what we call an anti-symmetric wave function and uh, so this is a, a, it's a, a general statement really so uh, what happens in the physics we have names for those particles that obey symmetric wave function and uh, names for those particles uh, obeying the anti-symmetric wave function so for the symmetric case particles are called bosons and for anti-symmetric case particles are called fermions now you may have learned bosons and fermions in a different fashion so the bosons are what we call the integer spins particles and this is the fermions are what we call the half integer spin particles now the connection between the, uh, the symmetry the exchange symmetry and the spin is quite uh, complicated and uh, 
one really needs uh, uh, maybe I just write that down for you information here uh, relationship between exchange symmetry and spin uh, can be known in a, a, an advanced theory called quantum field theory, which is a beyond uh, what can be done in this particular course. Okay? So we will not uh, go into that, but there is this relationship between the exchange symmetry and the spins. Okay? So, okay, let's just uh, see what can be said further, uh, say with bosons and fermions. Well, let's suppose I'm doing this on my knee, so it's a bit unstable. Let's suppose uh, phi, uh, let's say phi i x1 is a single particle wave function for either the boson or the fermions. Okay. Uh, boson or fermion. So we're going to do both. Uh, so consider two bosons then. One could actually build up uh, a two boson wave function from the single uh, boson wave function in this particular way. Uh, so, sine boson, then you have two locations here, x1, x2, then I can write it in this following way, phi i x1, phi j x2, but remember, I can swap these labels, and it should give me the same wave function, so that means I would also need phi i x2 by j x1 okay uh, so uh, so that gives you the, the, the two particle uh, two boson wave function that obeys the exchange symmetry okay uh, so one could generalize this to three boson if you want to so or three bosons what does one do say then you have so excuse me for a minute because I'm in a hotel room really uh, not in home really. okay uh, so there's another occupant no, in the other room so I, boson x1 x2 x3 so there will be three locations here so how does one generalize that is to take all possible permutation and I'm going to do it a little bit different from the case uh, what's done in the book just to show you that uh, there are other ways of writing it down so by i it's one by j it's two by k x3. So I'm considering here is the permutation of your ijk so I can have the following so I will have phi i uh, better do this carefully so if you remember uh, how many permutations are there there should be uh, three factorial. Three factorial that means six terms. So you must have all six terms into this uh, wave function. So let's just stick with the oops, not plus. Uh, let's stick with the, the original way of writing it.
okay and then I'll do a cyclic thing so I get 5j x1 5k x2 by i x3 and then another cyclic one would be by k x1 by i x2 by 3 sorry no, what am I doing uh, control z by this is by i this will be by j x3 so that's only three terms. So this is uh, making the cyclic uh, permutation of i, j, k. So you sort of cyclic uh, move them the, the the labels around, and then j, k, i, and then k, i, j. But there is another one which is the reverse. So I can do that. So I have, if I do it from the reverse point of view, so I have five k x1 5j x2 5i x3 and then cyclic permutation of this will be 5j x1 5i x2 by uh, what was it k x3 and then the last cyclic of this uh, uh, cyclic move around of these labels will be psi phi i psi x phi i x1 sorry phi k x2 and phi j x3 so that there you can actually see uh, now all the six terms are coming in so this is uh, three factorial terms and uh, the one in the book it, uh, what it does is which effectively give you the same thing it sort of cyclic permutation the, the labels of your spatial uh, locations here I'm taking the labels of the quantum numbers here whatever that's supposed to represent okay then cyclic them around. Okay, uh, it amounts to the same thing. Right. So these are for the case of the bosons. Let's consider the case of the fermions. For fermions, remember it has to be uh, anti-symmetric. For say two fermions now. So I would need. Uh, a minus sign somehow so sine fermion x1 x2 uh, phi i uh, x1 oops something what did I do Am I still with you? Hello? Okay, I'm not sure what happened just now. So, uh, can you still see the whiteboard? Okay, great. So, uh, let me do this again. So, for the for the fermions, I will have two single wave particle wave particle function. So, so I'm giving them a different uh, spatial locations here but now if I exchange them I need a minus sign so this would be my i x2 y j x1 and you can see that this is anti symmetric under the change of uh, labels either the, the the quantum number labels or the spatial location labels okay and one of the things that that, 
that can, you can immediately see what happens over here if you take uh, the states, the quantum states to be the same and how is that uh, done over here is to say that i equals to j or phi i is phi j okay what will actually happen in this particular case is that your two particle state uh, wave function in the same uh, quantum state okay it's going to be zero so it cannot be in the same quantum state two fermions cannot be in the same quantum state and that is precisely what is known as uh, Pauli exclusion principle So what does it say? No two no two fermions can occupy the same quantum state. Okay. So that's convenient. Uh, well. It, it, it tells us about no uh, later on we talk about how uh, the difference between the the behavior of fermions and bosons uh, probably perhaps a few lectures uh, in the future okay so uh, another convenience with this uh, thing is that one could write this two fermion uh, wave function. as a determinant so here uh, I'm writing say x1 to be your row and your quantum numbers sorry your quantum numbers to be your columns so if we take the determinant of this essentially uh, is equivalent to that okay so uh, generalization of this so say three fermions then you can just write in terms of determinants okay uh, so three fermions Then I will have uh, three locations x1, x2, x3. Then I will have, uh, say, uh, so the first one, first row will be all x1. first column with all five ones okay. and no that solves the problem of the uh, symmetry of the wave functions Oh, the, the other thing that, that should be of interest to us is, is the following. Uh, if, uh, besides just the quantum numbers, if you make, uh, let's do this as a side remark, if you make x1 equals to x2, then you also get your psi fermion to be equal to 0. So the, the, the two... Uh, uh, now I have to. There's a qualification to this uh, later on when we talk about spin. Okay, but uh, at the moment, if we don't consider spin, then uh, this will happen. 
if you take uh, uh, no spin degrees of freedom. Okay, so in other words, uh, or another way of saying this, for example, is to think of your your electrons, for example, if the both electrons are spin up, then they cannot occupy the same spatial location. Okay, so this is one of the things that that can happen. Right. What else? Uh, the other thing about this is also the fact that. Uh, uh, how shall I say this? Uh, you can see that the anti-symmetric behavior. Oops. Okay, never mind. Uh, anti-symmetric behavior through exchange of. Uh, columns, so the columns would be the quantum numbers, or of rows. So this will be the spatial location. Okay. So this is uh, quite convenient. So. Uh, why is the boson not having this that that convenient uh, uh notation uh so let me go back to black so fermions uh described through determinants Now, what about bosons, you might ask? Well, bosons can also be given a kind of the same notation. But uh, it means something else. Okay? So, determinants are what we call uh, signed permutations. where permanents are coming from all possible permutation but with no sign. Okay. So there is a, 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 a mathematical object called permanence which is uh, analogous to the determinant. But no, uh, I don't want to go too much into that but it has the same kind of uh, notation as the determinant. Right. Uh, Okay, I'm doing time so 10:41. Okay, so uh, one of the things, uh, so in other words, over here we have we are only considering the case where uh, you have two fermions or three fermions or two bosons or three bosons. But of course, you can generalize to to any number any number of fermions or bosons the generalization but how can we how can we con conveniently uh, write the wave function in this particular case or the quantum state well we can write it in terms of uh, occupation numbers Uh, how many particles occupy a particular quantum state? How many particles uh, occupy occupy a specified quantum state? So that is what we meant by occupation numbers. Okay, so how do we write them? Usually we write in this particular form. Uh, 
so your quantum state is now given by this abstract looking notation of no we have seen this before so here is n1 n2 n3 are what we call the occupation numbers where ni just say that there are ni particles in the state uh, in the st epsilon i I'm not sure what does that particular sound is am i still with you okay so right okay so uh so one of the things over here is that for bosons, the occupation number can be anything, any number. See, for bosons, ni is just an integer. Okay, whereas for fermions, since it cannot occupy two 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 fermions cannot occupy the same state so your ni can only be 0 or 1 okay. so that gives you a lot of difference between the two types of particles and then uh, once you do this for example then one can write the, the energy levels energy of say, psi i is given by ei equals to n1 epsilon 1 plus n2 epsilon 2 plus n3 epsilon 3 where epsilon i is the, the energy of the single particle state okay so okay i have about 15 minutes left so let me continue so that no we can, can progress a bit further than this so the next thing, okay, so what we have done is just to talk about uh, the different exchange symmetry giving you fermions and bosons and how they occupy the single particle states, okay? So now what we want to do is to talk about the partition functions. So now we, we are going into uh, you know, the statistical mechanics of this. Partition functions for identical particles. And uh, to do this, we shall uh, make a simple example first. Consider uh, this a simple example of a system with three energy levels. So what the energy levels, uh, we just simply label the following. So here you have the energy levels. So here your epsilon equals zero. Um, maybe I should not call it epsilon here. Because I want to use that for the other uh, energy levels. So here is energy level zero. This is the uh, first energy level. And then the, the next one is Two epsilon, which is the uh, third energy level. Okay, so you only have three. So this is just a toy example, just to demonstrate what can you get uh, from from these types of uh, system for fermions and for bo bosons. Okay, so how can say two bosons occupy this? Uh, states. These levels. So let me draw the cartoon picture. It's, it's in the book as well, but no. So I know I'm going to have six different uh, possibilities. Okay. So let me just draw the, all the lines first. Two, three, four, five and six so the uh, remember uh, the two the two bosons 
can occupy the same state. So it could occupy in the lowest energy state or it could occupy one in the lowest and one in the next energy state or even one in the lowest and one in the other state okay or it can occupy both in the the, uh, the first epsilon energy level here or it can occupy in this way or it can occupy all in the the, the highest energy levels and it can sort of uh, give you uh, what's the energy uh, state of this this is going to be just simply zero because both uh, bosons are in the zero energy level so here the energy will be epsilon here the energy will be two epsilon here two bosons occupying the epsilon energy level so that will give you also two epsilon and then this one this would be uh, epsilon plus two epsilon which is three epsilon and finally this is four epsilon so if one try to uh, uh, let me write down the uh, so this is the energy so let me write down the states uh, in terms of the occupation numbers so the occupation numbers here would be two zero zero here would be uh, one one zero here would be one zero one here would be zero two zero and here would be zero one one and this would be zero zero two okay so these are all the occupation numbers. And the partition function for this cannot just be the sum of all these possibilities. Partition function will be, so this is the boson case. Uh, first is the, the zero energy level that gives you a one and then the uh, epsilon here and then the two epsilon so the two epsilon there are two of them so there will be this is essentially the let me just push this thing up okay. Oops. not that no. okay. uh, I'm push the whole screen up so this is what we call the degeneracy factor there. Because there are, there are two different states with the same energy levels. Okay. Uh, factor. And then we have E minus 3 epsilon KVT plus E minus 4 epsilon. So you can see that okay, it's just a matter of seeing how how your your bosons are going to occupy these different uh, energy levels. Now let's try to do this for the case of fermions. Okay, for fermions, how does for two fermions? Okay, for two fermions. There are only three possible cases. Okay. So remember they cannot occupy the same state. So one can be at the lowest energy state and the other should be in the, the other states. Or it could be this. Or it could be this. And uh, the energy here. So you can write down the energy here. This would be what? Uh, this would be epsilon. This would be two epsilon, and this would be three epsilon. Oops. Okay. So this would be uh, one one zero. This is one zero one, and this is zero one one in terms of the states. 
So, and you can see that your partition function now simplify only to three uh, sum terms, which is E minus epsilon on KBT plus E minus 2 epsilon on KBT plus E minus 3 epsilon on KBT. So you can see there's a lot of difference between the two uh, boson and fermion cases. Okay. Uh, now what we're going to do next is try to generalize this a little bit further just to give you uh, uh, so here generalized to more energy states. Or two bosons of fermions. So uh, let's do it for the case of boson first. So your Z boson can have the w, uh, doubly occupied states, which is going to be giving you this, for example. So let's consider the 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 this first energy state is epsilon one, so that gives you a two two epsilon one on KBT, meaning uh, the two bosons are in the epsilon one epsilon one energy levels, and then. E minus 2 epsilon 2, this will be a different energy levels. Again, W occupied plus E minus 2 epsilon 3. And you can go on until whatever energy levels that is available to the, the bosons. And then uh, you have uh, where they occupy different energy states. Here is a minus epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 KBT plus E minus epsilon 1 plus epsilon 3 KBT plus uh, so you have all these different possible combinations with uh, epsilon 1 and then you can do this for others as well this is epsilon 2 plus epsilon 3 kbt plus e minus epsilon 2 plus epsilon 4 kbt so you can have all these uh, uh, singly occupied states okay and for fermions two fermions these terms will be absent, okay? So you're gonna have the, the one on the second line and the third line of the boson case. Okay. Okay, so uh, now you have a feeling of how uh, how this are done for you no know, when you have more energy levels, and you can now you no know, generalize again for more than two, you know, three bosons and four bosons and so on. Okay. Uh, but let us see what is the real effect of this so-called exchange symmetry either for the fermions and, uh, or the bosons, if one considers the case of distinguishable particles,
So what this one have is going you're going to get your partition function to be factorized. Uh, you probably have seen the factorization of partition function before. So this will be given by uh, so Z2 here means two particles, okay? So this can be factorized as a, a single part, uh, particle uh, wave function. And uh, this will be square. Okay. So this is given by what? So this is given by some uh, E minus epsilon i kbt. So here's the sum over i, and then the other one will be sum over j, say. So I'm running out of time. So, uh, and if we try to expand out, you can see there are some difference between the distinct, distinguishable case with the, uh, the case of the bosons and the formulas. And we'll, we'll discuss this again, how to make corrections uh, to this, uh, to the cases of these uh, distinguishable particles. Okay. So I will stop here for today. Let me take the attendance. Attendance. Okay, I think that's it for today. So we'll we'll continue on 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 Thursday. And uh, remember that we are supposed to set our second test on the week after. So let's hope that I can finish my finish the second assignment uh, questions by today or tomorrow. Okay. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor.